Welcome to the Versus History Podcast with your hosts, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Connell Smith, and Elliot Watson. Hello, my name is Rakesh Patak. I was very lucky to be with you eight or nine months ago talking about cricket, and, and I'm back to have another hopefully interesting conversation with, with Patrick today about what I think is the greatest of games. I'm a cricket blogger at the Red Bull Radical.wordpress.com, mainly as a way of processing the many woes of English cricket at the moment, but also as a way of kind of passing on my, my, um, my love of this wonderful game. So I'm looking very much forward to being with you today. Oh, we're absolutely blessed, Rakesh. Now, listeners, if you tuned in to episode 111, you'll be familiar with Rakesh. He talked to us all about the English game, the international game, the advent of T20, why Canadians don't play cricket, even though they were part of the British Empire, a whole host of topics. So if you want the backstory, go back to episode 111. But if you want the contemporary story, obviously getting it now via this podcast episode but you can also go to Rakesh's very very assiduous blog it's the Red Bull Radical go search that up on on Google and I'm sure you'll find it there Rakesh it's our pleasure to have you back again my good sir would you mind just telling us a little bit about your blog because I love reading it I read a lot of sports blogs sport is my thing and of all the sports cricket is definitely my thing and always has been but your blog is really really detailed and it's I, I, I love it it's like there's very few that can sit on a pedestal with um, Nasser Hussain and, and Michael Atherton, but from the amateur well, world, I'm sure, I'm sure you're one of them, my friend. Tell us about well, the Red Bull Radical, just to get the ball rolling. Well, um, that's very kind of you to say, Patrick, when probably English cricket is currently at a pretty low ebb. In a, in English cricket's historic crises tend to be associated with, with losing the ashes to Australia, the kind of historic rivalry certainly for English cricket and England have had a very bad Ashes defeat to Australia uh, this winter that usually leads to bouts of soul searching in the English game and uh, perhaps the other reason I started it was obviously in in, in my day job I'm a history teacher and I'm, I'm just sensing with it with cricket at the moment that we're kind of going through a period of what I think you know, future generations will look back on as a, a kind of pivotal period for the game. I mean, the game in this country is currently back battling a participation crisis, even an existential crisis, one might say a racism crisis as well. So, you know, it, it does, I, I do sense it's a very important period historically for the game at the moment. And I just wanted to kind of try and record my thoughts on that, hopefully for, for a wider audience as well. Thank you very much, Rakesh. You're right to mention the, the swathe of issues that have been raised. And I know your blog touches on, on some of those. So let's go to one of your blog posts. April 2022, you did something quite dangerous for any historian, really. You made predictions about the future, Rakesh. So of all mm. the predictions you make in that blog, and listeners, just search for the Red Bull Radical, go to the blog, and you can find the 10 or so predictions that Rakesh has made. Which one do you think was a bang on? And which one now seems like something of a fanciful folly? As, as a history teacher, Patrick, I, I, sh- I should have been wise to this. Um, you know, <laughs> you the, should have been the, indeed. The, 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 the wise historian never makes predictions. Yes, knowing the past is, is no guarantee to the future. I mean, in, in one of my earlier blogs, I even picked, I think, a team to watch in English cricket for this season and this may be the forum Patrick to issue a public apology to some of those players um, (laughs) because I've I've probably not done them a huge amount of of, of favours there some of them are doing very well you know the likes of uh, Jordan Cox Daniel Bell Drummond at Ken of uh, scoring some good runs Ben Mikes having a good season at Leicester Saranga Latmels I think been a great overseas signing for Derbyshire Ben Brown's doing very well at Hampshire um, a couple of the players I picked to watch haven't yet played a game, Patrick. But maybe that says Ooh. more about them. Um, um, it's a long season. It's a long season. But yeah, I mean, it, in a couple of the predictions I made, you know, I was talking a bit about the, um, the pitches this season. And obviously with cricket, I think it's one of the unique fascinations of cricket. It is so dependent on atmospheric and kind of soil conditions. You know, I, I think that makes it extremely unusual as a, as, as a 21st century pastime in many ways. And this season in English cricket, there's been a big debate that the pitches have been too friendly to bowlers for too long. 
and we seem now to be kind of swinging perhaps to the opposite extreme. And so that that's something I've, I've picked up on. My prediction for the championship that Hampshire are perhaps going to be the, um, the team to beat. I'd stand by that. I think this could be their year. So yes, I'm, you know, as a history teacher, I should know better than to make predictions, but at, at least a couple of them um, I would stand by. Very brave of you, Rakesh. Well, it's, I tell you what, if we were good at predicting the future as history teachers, we would probably have been stockbrokers <laughs> rather than history teachers. So there, there you have it. We can Maybe. forgive you that one. OK, let's move on to a quite a contemporary issue. Joe Root has just resigned as the England Test captain. How should historians looking back at Joe Root's tenure in the future remember him or look at him or analyse him? Was he a success? Was he a um, failure disguised as success or something yeah. in the middle? Neither. <laughs> what, what do you reckon? A really, really interesting question, Patrick. I, I think, I mean, I sense that the careers of most English cricket captains, you know, perhaps like political careers, they all end in failure to, to a greater or lesser extent. Very few English captains get to leave exactly on their own terms. Again, with my history teacher's hat on, I would like to see him as a success and also as a, a really interesting example of how traditions can evolve. He's come out of one of the great heartland of English cricket, which is Yorkshire. And the traditional, dare I say, stereotype of, of Yorkshire cricket is the kind of gritty opening batter, perhaps the fiery fast bowler. You think of your Fred Trumans, your Darren Goffs, or in you know, for the batters, Jeffrey Boycott perhaps might be players that um, I'm sure you're, a lot of your listeners would be familiar with. And what Joe Root's done is I think he's kind of reinvented that tradition. He's not, a, he's never been a batter in that mould. Um, I think he's a highly inventive, highly creative batter. Absolutely great to watch. I think he'll go down as a player as historically, I would place him, I think as the greatest batter English cricket's had since Jack Hobbs. You're going back to the 1920s. So no, almost 100 years, Jack Hobbs is the only English player to be one of the five wisdom cricketers of, of the century um, in 2000. I would place him in, in that category in terms of historical significance as a player. I suppose the unfortunate thing with him as a captain is... You know, it's been a very tough period to be captain. We've just coming out of a pandemic. So, you know, the challenges of maintaining international sport and team bubbles in that have, have been huge. Um, he's had to deal with that. The growing preponderance of white ball cricket has been a challenge for him. So he's never really able to get um, his best team out on the park um, at various times. That's been a real challenge for him. I think he'll probably be judged by um, amongst ex-players, um, people who perhaps know more about the the real nuances of, of, of the game than, than myself, who've played the game to a high level. I, I don't think he'll, he'll be viewed as a great tactical captain. I think in the grander scheme of things, I think he's brought a, a huge amount of moral integrity to the role. Um, you know, being captain of the English cricket team carries with it quite a lot of historical and political baggage. And I think he, he's carried that burden, I think, with, with huge dignity. He stood up for some of the better values of the game um, at points. I think good positive stands on things like racism and homophobia um, in cricket. And, and for that, he's got to be applauded. Absolutely with you on that and on you know, far less important levels. I, I remember when he first took the role and I remember him sort of doing some part-time bowling and I thought it was terrible. And by the end of his tenure, he mm -hmm. certainly wasn't, a terrible part-time bowler, was he? So I know that doesn't in any way no, uh, stand up to some of the issues you've, you've just mentioned, but he, he was a grafter. He really, really, really was. Yeah. And uh, by, by the and end of it, he could, he could bowl some... Out of all the part-time bowlers England have had, I'm trying to think who was the best part-time spinner as maybe sort of Graham Hick, who was very average at best. Joe Root mm. was certainly a lot more accomplished than him. Yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, he, he's almost become so accomplished as, a, as, as an off-spinner um, that... You know, that, that's one of the reasons England have been able to field teams without a frontline spinner, someone like Jack Leach, because actually Joe Root's off spin um, has actually become very serviceable. Um, he, he took um, five wickets against India um, last winter. Um, so, yeah, um, he's a, um, yeah, I think like all batters, he loves to bowl. <laughs> absolutely and not just declaration bowling either exactly. thank you very much for that racket mm -hmm. much appreciate okay so the next one is also a little bit controversial this question stems from my own experiences when i was teaching in sri lanka 
and I was in Gulfort, where there's actually an international cricket ground. Mm. And there were some Australians there and got chatted to them and the topic of cricket came up and a lot of them were saying, but, you know, England's the home of cricket, but you're so terrible at it as a nation. And <laughs> my response was, yeah, uh, OK, but we are quite a small nation. To which they retorted, well, Australia's got fewer people than, than Britain. So my response there was, yeah, but cricket's not that big a game in England anymore. It may seem that way because mm. of the fanfare and there's obviously Old Trafford, Oval, Edgebast and Lords. But not a lot of people actually play it. It's really now just confined to private schools, really, as a conduit into the professional game. So I said, now, if you went down sort of, you know, Regent Street or if you went through Hyde Park and asked 20 people about cricket, you might only find two that have any interest in the game. So that was my retort. Now, here's the question for you then. So to what extent is cricket now again played largely and sort of solely in private schools? If that's true, if it is a game played largely in private schools, to what extent do you think that is harmful for the future of the game? So the second question sort of depends largely on the, your answer to the first rapish. So uh, was I barking up the wrong tree? What do you think? It's a contentious no. issue. What do you reckon? Over to no. you. No, I mean, I think obviously it is a very contentious issue. I, I think, Patrick, you were barking very much up the right tree. It is, I talked at the start about kind of cricket even facing an existential crisis. Um, and, and that would be one of the reasons why that actually um, in this country, private schools educate approximately 10% of the you know, UK student population. No, organised cricket or schools cricket is largely now confined to, to those schools and they do it absolutely brilliantly, as is the case at, at the school I currently teach at with high quality coaching, high quality facilities. There is a great production line um, of those players from those schools um, going into professional cricket. Now, that is a good thing. But the fact remains that that is, you know, a relatively narrow section of English society. And you might go back perhaps to the 1950s, 1960s in England, and you would have, you would have found more state schools playing, more um, state schools, government-funded schools in the UK with playing fields. A lot of those have now been sold off. There were also in the 50s and 60s and 70s probably more workplace teams. So companies having their own sports grounds, things like that, um, workplaces having their own sports grounds and cricket teams. A lot of that has gone as well in the last 30 or 40 years. So the danger for cricket is its kind of horizons have narrowed over the last 20 or 30 years, which is opening it up perhaps to charges of elitism. I think what's not helping there also is that um, this is maybe where the new um, version of cricket in England, the 100, might be helping. But apart from the 100, there's very little cricket on free-to-air TV. Um, in the UK anymore. A big issue for cricket, yes, is that it's, you know, it is, in, I think, increasingly played by, by quite a, a narrow stratum of society. You know, there are other barriers to entry for the game as well. It does have an image, which I think it is trying to break down, of, of being perhaps quite a socially exclusive game. Um, it's just an expensive game um, to get into. Um, you know, if you want to start playing for a team, you've probably got to get some kit. Um, you know, that kit's probably even for, you know, a son or a daughter, it's probably going to set you back at least a hundred pounds, uh, maybe more, you know, in these inflationary times, um, you know, that that's a barrier as well. I think the solution, the county clubs are doing a lot of good work. I think local cricket clubs are also doing a lot of good work as well, because, you know, if you're not playing cricket at, at school um, and you want to broaden access to the game. I think local cricket clubs, which are still in, you know, most towns and villages up and down the country, um, so cricket still does have a, a footprint in English society. Um, they've got to be the vehicles, I think, for getting the next generation involved. The next question is about Red Bull cricket, which is my preference. So the longer format of the game, not just that played in 20 overs or 100 balls or, or, or sort of one day cricket. With the county championship being streamed on YouTube, now for the benefit of those that don't know what that is, that's the four-day game, so where teams bat twice, so the longer format where the counties play each other, that's now being streamed on YouTube. I'm sure we all know what that is. So 
is red ball cricket undergoing something of a resurgence vis a vis white ball cricket, which is sort of IPL or T20 or the shorter format? So, is this leading a vanguard or a spearhead which is going to lead red ball cricket? Sort of back to the front pages or the front of the back page, if you see what I mean. So are we looking forward to brighter days for Red Bull cricket? I think, Patrick, that probably a bit optimistic to assume that, that, that Red Bull cricket is going to kind of supersede White Bull cricket in, in, in the 21st century. Um, I think it might be more about just kind of securing Red Bull cricket's place in kind of society and the game for the next generation. Um, you know, after all, I, I think it's not a very... 21st century friendly pastime um, in some ways, Red Bull cricket. It lasts four days in the county championship, five days for a test match. You know, unless you're retired, um, you know, very few people have, have got the, you know, um, the time in, or maybe even the patience um, for a game that lasts, you know, to, that lasts that long. Um, you know, and, and yet results of kind of putting the streams kind of on YouTube and things like that would suggest is that you know, there is definitely a market. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the stereotype of Red Bull cricket at county level is, you know, you get, you know, three retired people and, you know, and their dog along to a game and, you know, nobody watches it. You know, actually, you know, Red Bull games at county level, I go along to Chelmsford reasonably regularly um, for Red Bull games. There's always several thousand at Chelmsford. Um, Taunton, um, down in Somerset, Headingley, Scarborough, every summer always sells out. And these are for Red Bull games. These are for not for T20. This is for Red Bull domestic cricket. Um, so, and, and, and that I think is, is fairly unique um, around the world in cricket. Um, that, no, these are for domestic games. If you look at some of the YouTube figures, some of the counties are putting together really professional operations now. Um, you know, um, Lancashire in particular, um, you know, really running their own TV channel, essentially. Somerset as well are really good. Um, so, you know, Somerset getting upwards almost a quarter of a million views per match. Uh, day one of Warwickshire, Worcestershire um, got 60,000 views. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, for, for a domestic sport or for a sport at a, at a domestic level, um, you know, these are good figures um, and would suggest... Um, that, you know, Red Bull cricket um, still has a, a kind of um, a, an audience um, and a potential for a growing audience as well, I think. Given the current trajectories and trends that you notice in cricket, what will be the state of play, do you think, in five or perhaps ten years for the following things? Um, you can pick up on any of these and emphasise any which ones that you want. Uh, we've got the IPL, the 100, women's cricket and England's test team the men's team okay um right so i'll kind of maybe give a you know, um, fairly broad survey patrick of let's say in it um where we might be um in 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 five or five or ten years time perhaps um, um i think we've if i can start with the kind of domestic structure of kind of in english cricket kind of county cricket um i i think you know i'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that actually um you know Obviously, with, with, you know, the England's test woes often get blamed on the county game. Obviously, they've, there's been, you know, uh, you know, some big, big issues with historic racism and um, et cetera um, in English cricket over the last year. Um, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic that those issues are starting to be addressed by the counties. Um, Gloucestershire um, have just appointed... Um, uh, their first black president, David Lawrence, one of their greatest ever players, um, and one of the first um, uh, black British players um, to play for England. Um, so, you know, there, there are some, some optimistic signs there um, that there are, I think, genuine, there's a, I think a genuine sea change there about, you know, the need for greater inclusion um, of all um, communities um, in English cricket. And I look forward to seeing the results of that um, over the next five or 10 years. Um, I think the IPL um, will continue to be um, the centre of world cricket. Um, you know, I think it's been one of the most interesting developments in cricket over the last 30 years that, you know, when I first got into cricket in, in the 1980s, you know, 
the heartbeat of world cricket would have been probably the MCC and Lords. You know, where is the central world cricket now? You no, know, perhaps Mumbai. Um, you no, know, kind of you know um, Mumbai Indians maybe. Um, so yeah, I think you know that the IPL, um, if anything, you know, given you know the kind of continuing urbanisation, the growth of the Indian middle class, it may even expand its franchises. Um, I think it will continue to be preeminent. I think one of the really interesting things about the IPL um, is it's kind of a kind of like, a, like an ideas factory for cricket. Um, you know, it's um, it reminds you a bit of you know maybe some like Davos um, where you know all these kind of you know interesting people <laughs> from different spheres get together um, every year. So you, you've got you know players from all over the world, coaches, ex players, all coming together for one tournament. Um, every year. Um, so I think that will continue to drive innovation in the game. Um, I think one of the other things I really I know, I don't perhaps follow the IPL quite as closely as, as I follow um, English cricket. Um, I'm, as a history teacher, probably a bit of a bit of a traditionalist. But one of the things I really like about the IPL is every year um, it throws up a new player. Um, you know, maybe somebody who's kind of burst onto the scene um, you know, this IPL, um, it seems to be um, a young bowler called, um, um, called Umran Malik, um, who's bowling upwards of, you know, 90, 95 miles an hour. Um, and, you know, is the talk of world cricket as a result of that. Um, I say linked to that cricket, you, uh, linked to that, Patrick, you, you mentioned women's cricket. Um, and I think that the next stage forward for, for women's cricket um, would be... Um, to have um, a women's IPL um, alongside uh, the men's IPL. Um, and there's been, there's been talk of that in Indian cricket now um, for the last two or three years. Um, and there's, there's slow movement towards that. But, you know, India has the potential to have the best women's team in the world. Um, but um, it will need a women's IPL, um, I think, to support that. Overall, I think in, in women's cricket, um, I think we're moving towards, you know, and perhaps women's cricket on the evolutionary path, maybe similar to tennis, um, where, you know, men and women's tennis is on kind of, you know, I would say an, an equal level. That I think is where we'll end up with in cricket in five or 10 years time. Um, and maybe even mixed teams. Um, I, I don't see any reason why in 10 or 20 years time, we couldn't have, you know, just as you have mixed doubles in tennis, uh, why couldn't you have um, mixed cricket tournaments? Finally, just re returning to the to the England Test team, um, where where will that be? Um, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to think in five years' time, you know, we'll England will be better at Test cricket um, than they currently are. Um, I think um, <laughs> certainly things. I, I, I'm sensing, um, you know, we've reached hopefully the bottom of the barrel. Um, but, you know, given the popularity of long form cricket in this country, um, you know, the amount of money in the English game may be compared with some other countries, um, the support it generates, um, you know, there's, there's a well supported game, test cricket in England and our overseas supporters as well. Um, I think that should be enough, at least to make England a more competitive team. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to quite stretch it out and say we're going to regain the Ashes, Patrick, but um, I, I, I think we'll be better than we currently are. Yeah, well, couldn't be much worse. Uh, exactly. You've played, played it safe with that one, Rakesh. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Let indeed, for your time. It's so, so grateful. On behalf of myself, obviously, you have penchant for cricket and, and on behalf of all the listeners, thank you for sharing your erudite wisdom with us. And folks, get over to the Red Bull Radical blog that Rakesh runs. It's a treasure trove of, of wisdom and insight. So Rakesh, thank you so much indeed. Well, thank you for having me, Patrick. Always a pleasure to be on. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Versus History Podcast. Visit us at www.versushistory.com and follow us at Versus History on Twitter and Instagram. You can download all episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify or from wherever you get your podcasts.